The heart of Calvinism is the belief that man is intrinsically evil and that out of us can flow only harm. Fortunately, Calvin was not a chaplain in the court of King David because I believe David possessed his birthright primarily because he trusted his heart. Of all the things that David did, establishing an eternal dynasty, ancestor of Christ, establishing a united kingdom, all that kind of stuff, I think it's secondary. I think that's playing field, that's just stuff. Perhaps the most significant thing that David did was to establish the capital in Jerusalem. When David became king, he had insurgencies in the land, not just a civil war, but there were Philistines and a variety of other ites that were around at the time. The conquest of the land had never really been solidified the way God intended. So he looked around and found the most obdurate stronghold, which was in the city called Jerusalem, one that had been ignored, left alone by all previous generations of Hebrew warriors. And he said, um, really? You've got to be kidding. We're going to leave the enemy in the land just because they've got a serious attitude? I mean, isn't that the reason for getting the enemy out of the land? Because they've got a serious attitude. And he was not really captured by the city itself. He was offended at the presence of godless or anti-God people in the very midst of the land. How dare there be an enemy stronghold in such a strategic place? And out of that offense which flowed from his heart, he assembled his army, he attacked the city, he evicted the enemy, and established his capital there. He had no prophetic word from God that that was going to be the center of of human influence for millennia. He had no understanding that that was Mount Moriah where Isaac had been sacrificed. He had no knowledge or understanding that there would be a temple built there someday. He just knew that <laughs> this was a good place and it didn't belong to the enemy, so we have to do something about that. It's been interesting to come full circle over the last 30 years on this issue of anger. When we first started doing deliverance, it was very, very simple. There was one sin that opened the door to the demonic, and that was bitterness. And we learned to confess bitterness in a hundred different keys of music because that was the open door for all demonic. It was quite shocking when we discovered there were a couple of other sins out there that also opened the door to the demonic, but it was simple and good back then. And we learned to abhor anger, to abhor bitterness, because it was just a terrible thing would open the door for the demonic. And to come back full circle and to have room in our hearts to be grieved to the point of anger over things that aren't right from God's point of view has been an enormous journey. We are careful not to be offended about what's done to us, but to be offended, to take up an offense for the king, is actually part of our duty, part of our walk, part of our relationship with the king. And every one of us has it from a different key of music. I have a friend of mine who was in allopathic medicine and got out of that. She was a nurse in oncology. She went into acupuncture and she got bashed by people for the evil of acupuncture, the demonic darkness that comes from doing all this. And she pushed back and said, you want to talk about demonic darkness? Let me tell you what chemotherapy is like in the oncology department of a hospital. You want to talk about dark and evil. So she's taking up an offense for 
the whole concept of the human body that God has designed to be clean, to be pure, to be undefiled, and the idea of poisoning the whole body was just profoundly repugnant to her. Now I hear her words. I hear the logic. It doesn't land. I've never had cancer. I know a lot of cancer patients. I've never really been intimately involved there. I'm not a doctor. That's not my world, not my field. I don't take up offense for that like she does. On the other hand, I am a businessman. And I think in terms of return on investment, that's what a businessman does. And I look at the death of Christ on the cross, and it moves me to grief and to anger over the lack of ROI. Let me illustrate it this way. Suppose your son was doing something very unsafe on a camping trip with me, and I jump in and I save his life and I die in the process. My wife would grieve, my children would grieve, but, you know, a life for life, there is a certain poetic resonance, significance to that. But suppose your kid grows up to be a bum. Suppose he grows up to be a drug dealer, and he is actively, systematically killing people with his drugs and with his guns and the cartel that he runs. And my wife and my kids are sitting over here saying, huh, our dad, husband, gave up his life to save that guy's life? I mean, where's the ROI here? You know, the, the world would have been a better place if Arthur had brought his treasures to the world. And, he, and we gave up all of that for this guy? And I feel that way as a businessman. I look at the cost of what the cross represented and the price that Christ paid. He paid a big enough price to redeem everyone and to watch him get pennies on the dollar return on investment. That angers me. That grieves me. It moves me profoundly to say that's not right. And when I watch people use the cross and use the Christ of the cross in order to gain power, in order to gain money, in order to manipulate people, hurt people, I get angry. I grieve because it's just not right. And I believe that was the key to David taking Jerusalem, that he trusted his heart. He was doing it for himself. He wanted a capital for himself, but he was following his heart and saying, this is prime real estate. That doesn't belong to the enemy. This is not right to have a bunch of Jebusites in control of some prime real estate. They have to go. This land belongs to the Most High. And so following his heart, he kicked out the Jebusites. He established his throne there. And it was decades later before he discovered that amazing reality that in following his heart, he was following God's heart. And he was strategically positioned to take control of the threshing floor, to buy it from the man, and to establish the place where the temple would be and where the nations of the world would war for the rest of human history over control of that prime piece of real estate. But what's beautiful to me is he didn't do it out of obedience to God. He didn't do it out of a prophetic word. He didn't do it out of a revelation. An angel didn't tell him to do it. He did it because his heart was offended over the Jebusites being there. He did it for himself. And because his heart was pure, because he followed his heart, he possessed his birthright. My challenge to you is to double-check your heart. Oh, I know your heart has led you astray. Mine has too. The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. I know all those verses. I've known them for a long time. But I also know the verses that says we're commanded to love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. There's some good in our heart. And again and again... I've watched people follow their heart and discover to their amazement down the road that they were following God's heart because he had put part of his heart in their heart.
And that's what it took for David to quite accidentally possess his birthright of securing Jerusalem for the king because he trusted his heart. And it was God's heart.